Okay, thank you. Well, this uh, talk is quite a, a simple, straightforward one, simply explaining the Irish electoral system, and it's something that certainly the elected politicians will uh, know already pretty well from first-hand experience, but I'll just run through some of the background to it. So, PRSTV, everyone knows, is the electoral system. Deconstructing that a little bit, PR, proportional representation, and proportional representation is uh, a principle rather than a method. There are lots of ways in which we can achieve the uh, proportional representation. What the principle means, pretty obviously, is that, broadly speaking, parties end up with more or less the same share of the seats as they won of the votes, or even more broadly, that people are represented, groups are represented in rough proportion to their strength in, in, the, pro in, in the population. And that principle can be implemented by many different methods. Uh, after I've finished, uh, David Farrell will, will be talking about other methods of electing a parliament. And as you'll see then, if you don't already know, there are lots of different means by which pr the principle, the broad principle of proportional representation can be implemented. So PRSTV is one specific means of uh, achieving the implementation of this principle. STV, of course, stands for the single transferable vote. Single transferable vote meaning everyone has just one vote, and that vote <coughs> can be, as, as people will know if they ever watch the count in process, can be transferred from one candidate to another as the, as the count proceeds according to the directions given by the voter. The voter gives directions on the ballot paper as, as to what they want to happen to their vote. So that, that's, that's where PRSTV comes from, that's where the term comes from. Proportional representation is the principle. STV is one specific means of, of achieving that. Um, <clears throat> constituencies uh, that, that we need to, impl to implement PRSTV, well, these have to be multi-member constituencies because in any proportional representation system, the idea of proportionality in, in, it requires that we share seats out among parties or groups in proportion to their strengths. So we have to have more than one to, to share out in the first place. If there's just one seat per constituency, it can't be PR. So you, you, um, some people might have heard the phrase so I mention only to instantly delete it from the record, the phrase PR in single member constituencies, which people sometimes think, isn't that the way we elect um, a president or have a by-election? But no, it's not. That's single transferable vote in single member constituencies, which is an electoral system in its own right called the alternative vote, which David Farrell will be saying more about. But it's not PR. If there's just one MP per constituency, then it's not PR. And generally speaking, uh, this is a rule. Uh, the more TDs there are per constituency, the more MPs per constituency, the more proportional the outcome nationally. This is kind of iron law that academics have discovered about electoral systems. The more MPs elected from each constituency, uh, the more proportional the outcome uh, 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 nationally. In this country, <clears throat> constituency size, in terms of the number of TDs elected per constituency, is very small by international standard. All by in international standards, all constituencies these days, as has been the case ever since 1948, return just three, four, or five constituent uh, three, four, or five TDs. Before 1948, there were constituencies returning seven, eight, even nine. Galway, uh, the whole of County Galway, was a nine-seater for the first. 10 years of the state. So uh, uh, because of the way in which STV is implemented in this country, uh, national outcomes might not be very proportional. There's absolutely no reason, either in practice or under the Constitution, why constituencies should not be larger than that, why they shouldn't all return 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 TDs. And if, if that were the case, that would deliver more proportional results. The constituency, as many of you might know, stipulates three seats as the smallest number permitted, but it does not set any maximum number. There's no reason why average constituency size could not be, be larger. So the constituency sets three seats as the minimum, and another thing it says is that the ratio of population to TDs should be the same right across the country, so that that avoids any government doing not that any government would really think of doing such a thing, but giving more seats to areas of the country where, it, where it's stronger, as uh, sadly did happen back in the 1960s. 
So <clears throat> when we go to vote, that's an example of a ballot paper. It's all much too small for any of you to read. But anyway, most of you will have voted and have seen a ballot paper. So as, as we know, it lists all the candidates in alphabetical order. They're not grouped by party or anything like that. And <clears throat> many parties will run more than, more than one candidate. So that one there is actually from Cowan Monaghan of the, 19, uh, at the 2002 election. And in that constituency, both Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil put forward three candidates. But voters are not in any way constrained by party lines. Voters uh, simply rank all or as many as they want of the candidates in order of their preference. And the voters rank the candidates on the basis of any factor that's important to them. What factors might that be? Well, for most voters, that's still party. It's, this is not as true as it used to be. In, in the past, the great majority of voters did seem to think in party terms. It's still true that most voters think in party terms. So that's to say if someone gives their first preference to a Fine Gael candidate, the likelihood they'll give their second preference to another Fine Gael candidate, and so on. But uh, uh, the number of voters who do that is declining, though it's still, it's still true for most voters. But it could be something else. Uh, voters might think in terms of ability, for example. I think the most uh, able candidate on the ballot paper is, is her. I'm going to give her my number one preference. The second most able person who would be good for Parliament is him, even though he's from a different party and a different constituency. Some people will simply think in, in those terms of the best, best candidates. Locality, as we know, many voters do think in those terms. We see that particularly in two county constituencies, such as Leash Offaly. There are some voters who, from Leash who want a Leash person, regardless of party. People from Offaly want an Offaly person. If that's the way they think, PRSTV facilitates them in, uh, in giving expression to those preferences. Gender, it could be. People m might want more and more women in Parliament, might have a tendency to vote for female candidates across party. It could be policy stance, something that cuts across party lines, such as uh, uh, European integration or abortion, for example. Some voters might vote for all the candidates who share their stance on that issue regards a party or anything else. So it's up to each individual voter to decide on what basis they, they award their allocations. So for better or for worse, and we'll come back to that, that, uh, that, that question in the afternoon, for better or for worse, this does give a lot of power to the voters. And it does mean that every candidate is competing against every other candidate, and that includes other candidates of their own party. Every candidate is, is competing against candidates from other parties, and, but also, and maybe especially in some cases, candidates from their own party. Um, so voting for voters is pretty simple, pretty straightforward, as, as they say in countries where they adopt this and have to publicize it. They say it's as easy as one, two, three. Counting the votes is less straightforward. And arguably, voters don't need to know the details of how the votes are counted and how a, vote, how a result is delivered in much the same way as if you... Um, buy a new television, you need to know how to control it and how to get what you want out of it, but you don't need someone to come along and explain exactly how every component inside the television works. In a similar way, people probably should be assured that the system is delivering the kind of results they want from it or the kind of results it's supposed to deliver, but maybe it's not essential that they understand every last detail of how a fourth count surplus is distributed. But basically speaking anyway, the, uh, the counting process revolves around the quota, a familiar term to many people, and that's calculated by that formula of votes divided by seats plus one plus one. So to flesh that out with, a, with an example, suppose we've got a constituency with 60,000 votes and four seats. What's the quota going to be? Well, we add one to that four, giving us five. We divide 60,000 by five, which gives 12,000. We add one to the result, giving us... 12,001. So that's the way the quota is uh, cal calculated. And as most people will know who've, who've ever followed an STB count, the whole counting process revolves around the quota. Candidates reaching the quota are deemed elected there and then, almost always on the first count. We don't have the, the requisite number of candidates elected. So then we get into the transferable part of the system the transferring of votes comes into play. It's very rare, I think it's about 60 years since the last time 
the, the requisite number of people were elected on the first count. So I'm going to go into now the ways in which votes, were, votes are transferred. If I was to explain this thoroughly, it would take another half hour, so I'll just go over it briefly. But if it's, if it's too brief, well, there are um, either further questions or, or reading matter to, to uh, flesh that out. But broadly speaking, anyway, there are two types of vote transfer. One is transfers of votes from candidates who have exceeded the quota and they're deemed to have a, a surplus. So, for example, if the quota was 12,001, as in that example, one candidate won 20,000 votes, well, they've got a surplus of almost 8,000. They're surplus votes, and those votes are transferred on to other candidates in accordance with the second preference marked. So, in effect, the, the, the returning officer is going back to those voters and saying, saying to them, look, as it turned out, uh, that candidate didn't need as many votes as they got. They only needed 12,001. They got 20,000. Rather than have nearly 8,000 of you waste your vote by having cast it for someone who didn't need it, tell me who, who you would like to benefit from it instead. And the vote can then be transferred on to, to another candidate. So this avoids votes being wasted for someone by having been cast for someone who turned out not to, not to, to need those votes. So that's the, the, the distribution of surpluses and the technicalities can be a bit complicated. We won't go into those. The other kind of vote transfers come from uh, transfers of votes from the lowest placed candidates. These are people who in the rather ominous phrase are des uh, described as being eliminated from the count. Their votes are transferred to other candidates, again in line with the second preference marked. So in effect, those voters are being asked by the electoral, by, by the returning officer, are being told by the returning officer, look, you cast your vote for a candidate who turned out to have very little support, and they weren't going to be elected. Who would you like to benefit from your vote instead? And the voter indicates that by who they write the number two for. So it then gets passed on to the number two choice, and maybe later on that number two candidate is eliminated, then it passes on to the number three, and so on. So again, this avoids votes being wasted by having been cast for a losing candidate who couldn't possibly benefit from them. So as, as we know, under other electoral systems, particularly the British electoral system, a lot of votes are wasted. They're cast for someone who finished third, and voters face a dilemma. Should I vote for someone who I think is going to lose, my favorite candidate who I think is going to be a hopeless loser, or should I vote for one of the leading two candidates, the one that I, uh, one that I dislike less? Voters are faced with that dilemma under the British system, under STV, they're not. They can vote sincerely because they know that even if their first choice doesn't do very well, never mind, it can be passed on to the second choice and, and indeed third choice if, if need be. So <clears throat> vote transfers do have an impact on the outcome, and we see this in practical terms. It's some, sometimes in a three-seat constituency, say, a candidate who came only fourth or fifth on first preferences, they, they rise up on transfers because they receive uh, transfers from eliminated candidates or maybe from someone who, uh, uh, sur the surplus of someone who was elected. Candidates themselves know this, so they don't just pursue first preferences, they look for lower preferences. If, if we've been canvassed or so if some people in the room have canvassed, they will, they will say, I'd, I'd like your first, preferences, your first preference, but if you can't do that for me, please, please remember me, please give me a high preference, please give me your number two or your, or your number three. And voters also know that lower preferences may make a difference. They may, they may not, but they may. You never know that 11th or 12th preference you gave to someone might make all the difference to the, electoral, to, to, to the outcome of the uh, election. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll finish really just by looking at the, the usage of the, the system. Um, as, as many people might know, it's not actually a very widely used system. There are only two countries that uh, employ this system to elect its lower house of parliament, the main house of parliament, in direct elections. That's this country and uh, Malta. There are other places where it's used in, in direct elections to elect... Um, <clears throat> subsidiary houses, it's used north of the border to elect the Northern Ireland Assembly. Uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the north, there are more MPs or MLAs per constituency, six in each, in, in each uh, of the, the 18 constituencies. 
It's used in Australia to elect the Senate. <clears throat> Things are a little bit different there, and it's used in a number of countries to elect uh, either local government or, or, or Senates in, in more restricted elections. Uh, the reasons why it's not more widely used, well, um, partly this is because STV is seen on the, on the, on the continent of Europe as a kind of uh, uh, Anglo version of PR. It, it's had very limited uh, success in non-English speaking countries. I'll say a little bit more about that this afternoon, but anyway, the main point here is that STV per se is not very widely used. So having given you that overview of things that most of you probably knew already, I'll finish there and uh, ask David Farrell to tell you about things that you might not already know. Thank you.